Hello and welcome in to the Fog.net podcast. My name is Michael Swain, the Kansas beat writer for 24-7 Sports. We have renderings. Good. We have renderings. I'm joined by Kevin Flaherty. We're going to talk all things David Booth, Kansas Memorial Stadium, the renderings that came out on Tuesday. In addition to everything that's going to go on with the Gateway Project, the Anderson Family Football Complex is also going to be renovated. we got a lot to talk about, Kevin. We're not even going to talk about the the on-the-field product that Kansas could be putting out there this fall. We'll cover that early next week. Expect a fall camp recap podcast. But today, today we're going to talk specifically about everything we heard from Travis Goff, Douglas Gerard, um, the governor of Kansas, Laura Kelly, spoke as well. A lot of, of high, powerful people in the state of Kansas and the University of Kansas spoke today. I was there. Kevin, I know you followed it along. Let's just start here. I think everyone kind of had an idea that the renderings were going to come out today. Kansas did a good job of publicizing that, making sure everybody knew that, hey, today's the day. But when you first see the rendering of what this could look like down the road with the full gateway district, what was kind of your first reaction when you saw this, Kevin? Really, really curious. Yeah, I thought it was beautiful and didn't look anything like Memorial Stadium. <laughs> I mean, when you when you look at it, I know that uh, – they're going to decide kind of with the East, it sounds like, and we'll get into this, you know, kind of what they're going to do with those stands or whatever. But when you look at the renderings, when you look at the lights, and when you looked at the accompanying video uh, voiced over by Kevin Harlan, I, I remember there's a scene where it kind of lights up, you know, and, and, you know, you see like the fireworks on the field with lights and everything. It just looks like a, a much more modern, uh, glossy, enjoyable college football experience than, than kind of what Kansas fans have had for the last few years for the yeah, last, I totally you know, agree. however long. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, maybe my favorite quote of the day was Chris Harris jr. Talking. And so they had a lot of different people speak. Obviously I mentioned, sure. you know, Laura Kelly spoke. I, I mentioned, you know, Travis Goff, Lance Leipold, they had Devin Neal speak. And then the guy that wrapped it all up, they had Chris Harris jr. Talk. And I thought it was hilarious. He comes up there and he's like, well, I'll tell you what, we were talking about a new stadium back in 2007. Yeah. And here we are 16 years later. And finally, a new stadium is going to happen. Um, I think there's a lot to get here, Kevin. I think for me, the thing that maybe I- I'm taking away from this entire day is maybe how real it feels. You know, I can't remember the exact year that that Zanger put out the, the first rendition of what the, the stadium was going to look like. But um, this has a much more tangible feel than that did. I don't know if you agree or not, but yeah. you know, for me, right this time last week, I was getting back from seeing the new locker room and seeing the new weight room um, and doing the content and videos around that. And I think having this right off the back of that, I think probably contributes to this having a general feel that this is real and that there is um, a tangible element to this, right? Travis Goff talked about the money aspect, um, or they've already raised a good chunk of money to make this happen. They still need to raise more money to get this across the line. But I think generally, for me at least, this has such a much more real feel than I think anything in the past regarding you know the stadium and the improvement. Um, do you have a similar feel? Like, well, what's your take on this? Obviously, I think you've been covering the program and around the program longer than I have. So for you, like, I mean, what's the feeling like? Because I think you could sense the excitement, I think, around some of the players and the coaches. But I think everyone feels like this is very real, very tangible, and it's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, the very first thing I did when the release came out was look for the date, right? <laughs> you know, like, when is when is this going to happen? And we see in, in college football scheduling so often, you know, Kansas is going to play, you know, Tulane in 2031, you know, some long off date where you can't really envision it even happening. You're just kind of like, ah, you know, you, you may file it away for later. You may not. No, this is, you know, the first phase, which includes substantial improvements and changes to Memorial Stadium itself is supposed to be done before kickoff in 2025. I mean, we, we're in 2023. We have this season, 2024, as I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, reduced capacity. And then 2025, it's there, you know. And yeah. so it's not some long, far away date where you say, okay, they're going to do the facility this year. And next year, they're going to do the event space and, you know, Memorial Stadium. Oh, they'll get to it in 2030 or, or something like that. 
no, we're we're going to see cranes and we're going to see construction and things like that within the next 12 months or so. I mean, when you're talking about the dates and, and things like that. And, and so when you're looking at it from that perspective, that made it so much more real. It wasn't a mm -hmm. pie in the sky thing. It wasn't, you know, I, I've seen some people talking about Gridiron Club today, you know, where, where Lou Perkins had the, uh, I think the $34 million is what it was. And they were going to pay for it by people signing up to stay in the club for a period of years or whatever. No, the, it, this isn't anything like that. They've already raised $165 million. They're starting construction. Next year, they aren't even going to be able to have full capacity because the stadium is going to be under construction. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was the thing that made it feel real for me was that it wasn't some faraway date or, hey, Kansas is going to kick off in its new stadium in 2034 or yeah. whatever. It was, man, we're we're going to start seeing construction on this thing here, here pretty soon, Swain. Yeah, I think that – Totally is right. And I was talking to Deshaun Warner over the summer about everything going on with the program right after he committed. And he had mentioned, well, I love that the the stadium, you know, it's going to be done, you know, by 2025. And when I heard that, I was like, whoa, that feels fast. Yeah. Right. I think you hear that date and you think about everything that's going to go on here and it feels fast. Obviously, I think the timing of it you think about it maybe a little bit more in depth, right? You're talking about a year and a half more or less because construction sure. will start after the conclusion of the 2023 football season. So realistically, I think you're looking at construction could start like December 1st of this like year. Six months, five months, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. You're, it, it's starting. And then we can get into the capacity stuff. Um, but then the progression of that, right? I think it makes a little bit more sense when you think about it. But in terms of the different phases, I thought that they did a really good job of in the renderings that they released and, for folks that haven't seen, go to fog.net. We've got a big gallery of the official renderings that they made available to us. Um, they're in a gallery. You can scroll through them all. It's got different looks of the stadium, different views, different parts of the phasing. For our YouTube audience, I've pulled up the end of phase one right here. So this is what it will look like at the start of the 2025 football season. What's going to be added is a convention center to the north side of the stadium. Obviously, I think a lot of people know the north side, right? You get, you enter through there. Some people do. Um, there's obviously a lot of the tailgating scene in the north neighborhood, but there will be that convention center there. You go to the east side of the stadium. This is the side of the stadium that will not be touched, yep. at least during phase one. And then behind it, right, the parking lot will still be there. The tailgate scene will still be there at the conclusion of phase one. So what you're really going to see is a real reconstruction of the west side and then going into kind of the north side as well. And so there's going to be, I mean, for me, there's a new press box that's going to be coming in. Real excited yeah. about that. No idea what it's going to be like next year. We'll have to see. But I think you see a rendering like this that I'm showing on for the YouTube audience. And it's really cool to see the progression to where then you see it at the final stage. And that's when they're going to have, I believe, the hotel um, some of the more amenities I, they've mentioned shopping as well, being a, something that's going to be added there. You know, Laura Kelly talked about, you know, jobs and revenue that's going to be generated from there. And then, you know, Douglas Gerard also talked about the fact that they're not trying to take away from mastery. Right, Kevin, I think you and I would agree that mastery is what makes Lawrence really special. You talk sure. to recruit, you talk to any student at the university of Kansas, what makes KU a special college town What makes Lawrence a special college town. Mastery is one of those things. And so they're not trying to detract from it. Rather, it seems like they're trying to add another element, another layer to where this can also be an entertainment spot. And I, I don't know if you heard this, Kevin, or not, but you know, Douglas Drod said too, they're going to look at having concerts, maybe yeah. having soccer games here. And I, you know, I don't know how it's going to work out, but I think soccer games here would be really cool. I don't know what type of poll they'd be able to have. I don't think Sporting KC would come. But what other clubs would maybe want to come on a summer tour? I don't know. So I think it'd be very interesting to see what the long-term use of it will be. Right now they're talking about things, but interested to see what it looks like in the long term. So I guess for you, Kevin, like when you see the phase one rendering, right? Like what are kind of some of your thoughts or what, what jumps out to you as someone who's probably going to the game, right? Not with the media credential, but looking to enjoy a, a product. 
Yeah. And, and just for those of you who are directionally challenged, you know, I, I understand there are a lot of us out there. Um, sure. The south end zone is where the scoreboard is. You know, to the south is the Campanile. The north is the bowl end of it. And so when, when you're talking about the the west and, and really getting the the lion's share, I feel like, a, of the, the first look, um, it, what you're going to see is going to be sort of the press box side or, or the side where, where KU typically is at. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, it, from a fan experience standpoint, um, they hit on all the right notes, right? I mean, you, you talked about uh, more slash better restrooms, you know, more <laughs> slash better uh, concessions, um, one of the things that they talked about was was seat width and, and having more leg room in addition mm-hmm. to that. And, you know, you you think about the fact that with the way Memorial currently is, you know, I'm I'm not the biggest guy, but I am probably a little bigger guy. Um, it, if you have a couple me sized people <laughs> sitting next to each other, it can get a little uncomfortable. It's a little mm-hmm. tight. And so having that extra space there is going to be nice. I think, um, uh, another big part that we haven't even talked about yet, a hundred feet closer mm-hmm. to the action. And they talked about being raised up a little bit. Um, so you're going to have the sight lines and things like that. You know, you're not going to be up closer to the field and be stuck, you know, watching the game behind somebody's pads, you know, whatever else you, you'll be able to see it. But at the same time, you'll, you'll be closer to the action. And so that that's been a huge problem for as long as, as I can remember. I mean, shoot, when I was a kid, you know, when, you know, the track was there and, and all these different things, it's just, you would go to other stadiums and, and some are arguably too close. I know, um, Swain, you've been to Oklahoma State where mm-hmm. the fans are, and dangerous. that wall is pretty much on top of the field to where it's it's almost dangerous. But I think you it appears that there's kind of a happy medium here where the fans are going to be on top of the action. You're going to have a better home field advantage than you would have had before. And, and so the fan experience, to me, they, they kind of hit on on all the right notes. They also yeah. talked about, you know, having more seat backs uh, um, in certain areas. You know, there are going to be different lounge areas and, and things of that nature. But, yeah, from a, from a fan experience standpoint, I, I really do think for the average fan, obviously, you know, Swain, maybe you could touch on it. For those who uh, have a little more disposable income than, mm-hmm. than I do, um, it, it sounds or like me. some good, uh, so, some good uh, improvements are coming by way of suites and, and things like that as well. Yeah, there are. And I think you're seeing this across college sports and pro sports to some degree as well is the emphasis on premium seating. Um, that's probably a conversation we can get to at another day, but um, <laughs> regardless of what you think about it, um, it's happening. And I think Kansas is embracing that where there's going to be more premium seating, right? Again, for the YouTube audience, I think you can kind of see, um, I can't really point to it, but you can see kind of on the left side of the screen there, how there is a spot for more premium seats and premium booths and things that I'm sure you can have kind of 20 people, you own it. Um, and just like they do now, but probably more of them. And so there's going to be better options for that. I think Kevin, what you mentioned though is spot on, right? I think for the for any casual fan who's going to go, and I say casual as in people that are not paying for the suites, people who are paying for just getting the door seats, it's gonna be more comfortable. And I think that's really nice for fans that they can go in and maybe enjoy the experience a lot more than sitting on the cold bench, crammed in with people. It can just get uncomfortable. And I think that's a really positive thing for the fan experience. Um now we could probably transition to the capacity discussion. Sure. So let's start here um, because obviously we know that there's going to be limited capacity during the 2024 season um, for folks that may have missed it. They are going to basically eliminate a good chunk of the seating as they do construction. So there's going to be limited capacity. They've not given out a specific number. Travis Scott literally got asked, is there a specific number for capacity? Um, during the limited capacity because Travis Goff said it'd be significantly limited. He danced around the question and didn't give an exact number. I I think you're looking at it. It's going to be tough to get tickets. And what 
Kansas has said is that if you buy season tickets for the 2023 season, you will have an opportunity to get in the stadium next season. That's all they've said. And I'm sure they will release more details at a later time, but that is what was said today. And so fans, obviously, if you want to guarantee that you're around to see next year's team, get season tickets. There's still some available. There's some good packages available too. If you go to KU athletics, so getting in the stadium next year is gonna be a challenge. Um, when you heard about reduced capacity and Kevin, this has been rumored and talked about maybe behind sure. the scenes for a while. So this wasn't a surprise to me to see, but when you hear reduced capacity for next season, I guess, what's your instant reaction? Like, what do you think when you hear that? It, you think, why are they doing this? This is terrible. Like, what's your thought? No, I think it was, it was going to happen probably in some respect. Um, yeah. it, you think about the other solutions, right? Like if you just said, Hey, you know what? we aren't going to deal with reduced capacity. Mm -hmm. Let's play somewhere else. I mean, you're looking at what sporting or arrowhead basically is as your main possible solutions, arrowhead possibly not even being a solution, but even beyond that, you know, you draw 50,000 fans to arrowhead and it looks empty and that's a great crowd. That's not saying, you know, if you draw 35,000 fans for the opener or, you know, 40,000 fans or, or whatever mm -hmm. you go to sporting. And, and I think you have the exact opposite issue where yes, you would technically have a, a good home field advantage, but at the same time, it it's maybe a little bit too small and we haven't heard the number of what it's going to be for, for 2024, but I'm just saying you're going to be dealing with, either a situation where you're in a place that's too big or in a place that's too small because there's mm -hmm. no other place that's custom built for the university of Kansas to play football. That's just the way that it is. And so, you know, it, it's, it's a solution. I, I think we'll, we'll find out, you know, what the number is and, and it'll be easier to have a take on, Oh, this was the wrong way to go, or this is the right way to go. I mean, are the East stands going to be the only stands that are open because they're working on the other ones? I mean, there, mm -hmm. there are different ways that they can go about this. And, and so I do think before everybody freaks out and says, Oh my gosh, like the, this is terrible for 2024. You, you kind of need to see what the plan is a little bit, but I do, you know, I do agree with you and, and agree with, with what Travis Goff was saying in that, you know, if you're that worried about it, get season tickets this year so that you're going to have a chance to, to be in there next year. You know, the, the cost for, for Kansas football season tickets are not that high. Like comparatively, when you look at, when you look at other schools, when you look at, you know, comparable things, it, it really isn't. And so when, when you look at all those things, and I know it sounds like we're banging the buy season tickets drum and, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, if you're really that worried about it, if you're sitting here saying, you know, I want to be in the stands in, in 2024, the easiest way to make sure you get there is, is to get season tickets. And, you know, it's not, like you said, it, it's not like Kansas is in a spot right now where all the season ticket spots for 2023 are, are taken up either, or all the good spots even. So yeah. it, it's available to you if that's something that's a worry for you. Exactly. And so I'm looking up right here, you know, there are still season tickets for $400, Yeah, you know, and that's like on the, that's on like the, the West side. And so, you know, obviously everyone has different income ranges and I'm sure they have different packages. If you I mean, look we, at it, we, we um, went to the Royals game last night and we did. I think, you know, I, I love the Royals as much as life itself, pretty much. I think our tickets were something like 35 a piece. So for, for two people, you know, 70 bucks, 30 bucks to park. So, you know, Worst. when you, when you, when you look at spending a hundred plus dollars a game to go to a Royals game, or you look at spending $400 for seven home games, probably, you know, what you're going to get. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's to, to me, that's not a, that's not a, a giant cost at, at all. No, exactly. And look, everyone has their discretionary income and how they want to use it. Totally sure. up to you, obviously. But I think for me, Kevin, when I heard, you know, when I first heard about limited capacity due to construction, 
the first thing I thought of, and this is a reference some people may not get, but you know, in soccer, Real Madrid's one of the biggest clubs in the world, yeah. and they've been redoing their stadium over the past three years, where they, I think, three years where they've had limited capacity. And you're talking about one of the biggest soccer clubs in the world taking the hit in terms of ticket sales and gate revenue to have a better experience. They might be increasing seating. I'm not 100 percent sure, but basically, you're seeing a big club in Europe in soccer do it it's okay i think if kansas football does it for one season and so i think for me that was fine now kevin let's get to the big question which is the overall capacity yes at the end of this you know kansas has been pretty um methodical with what they've said travis goff has just been very blunt and said it's going to be over forty thousand. now what does that mean are they going to count the convention center spots with it? Like there's a lot of different ways that I think it can be finagled, but he keeps saying over 40,000. So, I mean, Kevin, when you hear 40,000, then what do you think? Cause I think that's a number that I think there are some fans that have some issues with. So what do you sure. think about that, that number just generally for, for the stadium? Yeah. I mean, for me, I mean, and I may not be the best person <laughs> for this, but, mm -hmm. but for me, I mean, 40,000 seems a little bit low. Um, I, I get why 40,000 would be the sort of thing when you look at the last decade or so, if you would look at it and say, well, 40,000 seems plenty, <laughs> mm -hmm. but at the same time, we're coming off the worst decade of football in, in Kansas history, you know, and, and you look at, the fact that Kansas is currently at 47, I think somewhere around in there with, with the stuff that they have in the, um, in the North end zone and everything that cuts down on seating a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, it has been up to, you know, I think the, the all time records in the 52s or something like that, like back, uh, back in the, the early Mangino days. And, and I'm not saying it needs to be 52. I do think there's a difference between 40 and 45 though. And, yeah. and, maybe, and maybe I'm wrong on that, but I think that when you're at 40, you're at a little bit closer to the, this seems small for a power five or however many power conferences we're going to have at the end of this type school. Yeah. I think 45, you're, you're looking at, okay, it's, it's a little bit closer to, to some other schools that are maybe in that range and everything else. Yeah. And I thought the fascinating thing about it was they said it was over 40. They didn't say whether that meant 40,000 and one people. <laughs> they didn't say whether that's 46,000 people, but the part that was fascinating to me, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you took note of this as well. Mm -hmm. The fact that they said that, they're splitting this into multiple phases. And so it's flexible on the East side with what they can do and the, the type of capacity that they can have and that they're going to be looking at what Kansas fans are, are doing over the next few years before deciding what to, I mean, a, a couple things about that mm -hmm. stand out to me. Um, one, you know, sort of the, you know, hey, you know, get in the seats and maybe we'll we'll up this capacity thing mm -hmm. a little bit. But what did anything strike you about that? The fact that they said, you know, they didn't give a set number, but they said basically, hey, this thing could be increased if KU fans show us a reason to increase it. They're just so methodical, man. <laughs> methodical. It's smart. It's it's they are keeping the leverage on their end of things where here's my opinion. If it was going to be 46,000, Travis Goff would have said it's going to be over 45,000. Yep. Right. The fact that he says it's going to be over 40 tells me it's going to be probably between 40 and 45. And if I had to guess probably in the lower end of that, if I had to yeah. just guess um, now, I think what he said is incredibly smart. You leave the door open. Hey, sure. you come sell it out. Right. Phase yep. two, if we're selling out whatever it is. Say I'm just gonna say forty two and a half thousand, just because that's in between um, forty two and a half thousand. We're selling it out. You know, if you guys come and do it every week, then yeah, we'll make it forty five, or we'll make it more than that. That's smart. That's very smart. I think for me, I look at the capacity, 
And I think creating an environment that is intense is really what matters. And I understand getting fans in the door. I totally get that. And you don't want to price fans out of being able to afford tickets. Especially when you think about fans that have been doing going to games when KU is terrible. Trash. Like, fans still went to those games. You don't want to price some of those fans out. And so I, I get the the give and take of it. I see from a fan's perspective of saying, well, there should be more seating so that there's more affordable seating for families who don't have to go pay, you know, $400 for two parents and two kids, right? I totally get that. And then on the other end, I'd say, well, what's better for the long-term future of Kansas throughout the evolving way that people take in sports? Look. I, I've read a lot about this kind of trend, but young people are not caring about sports as much. It's just a trend. And so in 10, 15 years, is there still going to be that same appetite for college athletics? I don't know. And so I think by having a smaller capacity, you maybe lend yourself to still being able to have a really raucous environment. If 10 years from now, we're looking at a different generation of college students a different generation of adults being the ones that are taking in college football. So I think it's a give and take. I, I I hate sitting on the fence, but I'm going to sit on the fence here. I see both sides. And I think it's one of those where for me at the end of the day, what matters is when those guys are on the field is the other team intimidated because it's loud and it feels like the fans are on top of you. And does KU feel that momentum and how do they achieve that best? I don't have the answer. But I understand why going to 42 and a half is, again, my, my fake number. I understand why they do that instead of pushing it to 52. Because well, 52 and, and somewhat empty, right, feels a little sure. bit different, right? So say, let's say, you know, 38,000 people show up, right? 38,000 in a venue that fits 42 feels different than 38,000 in a venue that fits 52. So that's where I come at it from. I get that. And I think, you know, you look at the opener against Tennessee Tech, um, not to say that there were no expectations, but obviously you're coming off a two-win year. Mm -hmm. Um, 35,000 people showed up. It's the opener. Usually openers are higher in attendance than a lot of other games Mm -hmm. when your team is not good and the attendance dips over the course of the season. Yeah. Uh, they wound up selling out their next three home games at 47,233 fans. Duke, Iowa State, in game day against TCU. Sure. And game day against TCU, I mean, if they, if they wanted to fit another, you know, 5,000 in or, or plus, they probably could have that day. And, and I mean, I, I'm just saying that to, to get a feel for the high point on this. Yeah. They go on a, ro- on a road trip, right? They, they go to Oklahoma, then Baylor. They come back. They draw 43-6 against Oklahoma State. Yeah. So you would have another sellout there, theoretically, at 42-5, sure. if that's your magic number. The They wind up going on another um, – they wind up going on another road game. Yeah, they tech. lose at Texas Tech. Um, they come back, uh, and against Texas, they draw 38-2. And that's what you're talking about. When you draw 38-2, does it feel empty? Or does it feel like, hey, I can see some seats up in the corners or, you know, in this spot in the bowl, but it still feels like a full stadium. And and I 100% get that. I do think that, though, that it's difficult to limit yourself too much based on what we've seen over the last 10 or 12 years. Because that was really bad football. (laughs) <laughs> and, yeah. and fans didn't necessarily have a reason to, to mm-hmm. come out to Memorial Stadium. There wasn't a lot of hope. There mm-hmm. weren't a lot of expectations where people even felt like, hey, this is the year, this is the week, this is the whatever. And you think about in Lance Leipold's first year, they have Oklahoma on the ropes, and they're basically begging people on Twitter to come in for free. And, yeah. and like, I'm not trying to be you know, a a wise ass or or whatever. I'm just saying I get why you would have a lower estimate when you look at stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I also think not that it's dangerous necessarily, but I also think you don't want to limit yourself. Yeah, for sure. 
Kansas yeah. traditionally, up until the last decade, and this is going to surprise a lot of people, but <laughs> when, when Mark Mangino coached his final game, Kansas, as a historic program, was over a 500 football program. Yeah, and, and so, and I'm not saying you know Kansas hadn't been a 500 football program since the start of the Big 12. So I'm not saying that they will forever, you know, that's what they will go back to. But if Kansas is somewhere between seven and five and five and seven, a lot of years, I think you're going to have significantly better turnout than when fans feel like, Hey, you know, we're one and 11 this year. If things go right, it's three and nine. And, and so I do think that you want to also plan and give yourself some ability to take advantage of, Hey, if, if Kansas finds not even, an orange bowl high point, but if Kansas finds some level of consistency where fans just really want to come out and enjoy their Saturdays, that there's, there's enough seating there. Yeah. Let me ask you this, Kevin, if you could pick the capacity of Memorial stadium, what would you pick? I don't even know that I would go to, to 47. I, I think 45 might be my number. Uh, That's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. I, I, and I, you know, to be fair, when it was, when it was 50, you know, there were there were times when 50 was great when they were selling that thing out. And when there was 47, you know, this this last year, you know, they, they sold out and, you know, with a little bit better fan experience or, or whatever, you know, it it might have been just really, really daunting. I mean, the energy for that TCU game was was terrific. I was in the stands for that one. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, if you're kind of walking this balance beam as we are for where are you protected if you don't draw a great crowd and also having enough seats to where, you know, hey, it's a big game and fans want to be there. I, I feel like 45 might be kind of close to that magic number. Yeah, that's exactly what I would have said. 45. I think that's a really good number. Right. Because I think, like you said there, right, I think. 38,000 for a Texas game like that. I think you're still, if you, if you get 38, 39 in a stadium, that's 45, I think it feels okay. Sure. Right. It feels all right. Um, but then again, when you get North of that, then it's just, I think you get running some challenges. Um, yeah. I, I think it's a fascinating discussion and I'm really interested to see what the final number ends up being because I think the way Kansas has handled it, totally understand. Right. Yep. Keep the door open, and I think it's smart. See what the interest is as Kansas becomes potentially a more consistent program. They kind of get a trial year-ish, right, in 2025 and see what's it like, right? Because that will be kind of the first season guaranteed post-Jalen Daniels where you just see, right, what's the interest like? Like, where are we at? And then they can make a decision from there. So. I think that's pretty interesting. Um, any other final thoughts on the stadium, Kevin? There's some stuff with the Anderson Family Football Complex that I think is really cool. I'm mean, gonna I want to talk about that, but any more stadium specific thoughts? No, I, I just I thought it was really nice. I, I think the the numbers that they gave were four times as many concessions, 1.5 times as many restrooms, and you know, obviously, you know, that's all of that would would be great for everybody but I, I thought your point about leverage was was really well made and it's something that I think having a competent athletic director <laughs> and, and you know competent athletic department and everything we've seen at each stage right you know it, it's funny because I had one coach call me um, after Lance Leipold signed his extension. And there was the stuff in Leipold's deal about him being able to, you know, walk basically if Kansas didn't get on facility improvements. Mm -hmm. And um, the coach was basically saying to me, you know, it seems like that's a thing for Leipold, right? Like Leipold says, if you don't invest in me, I can walk. Mm -hmm. But the point that he made was, he goes, it's actually very clever. He said, because Kansas can now also come to boosters and say, hey, if we don't want to lose Lance Leipold, if we mm -hmm. want him to be our coach, like we, we have to get on this. And, and so exactly. the way that, that they've kind of rolled the program success, that they've rolled the buzz around the program into these different improvements and everything. It's, it's what you would want to see. I, I feel like in terms of how your athletic department handles it and how a competent athletic department would handle it. I totally agree. Can you time that point perfectly at the end of the video I played? Wow, I didn't, I didn't mean to do that. 
I love it. All right, let's get to Anderson Family Football Complex. Sure. Um, I talked to Lance Leipold along with a, another reporter off to the side um, afterwards, and I, I think Kevin, right? You've listened to Lance talk, and he mm-hmm. is a very calculated and reserved person. He's not like the other counterpart towards the east who gets <laughs> jumps in other coaches' arms. Like what? Never mind. Let's not go there. Um, he seemed really excited by the Anderson family football complex, the things that are going to happen to it. Um, I think first and foremost, right. Keep in mind, they're going to build this now where it's going to be more um, intertwined. And again, for the YouTube audience, um, you can now see this is going to be a part of the Anderson family football complex. There's a part where it's going to be all glass windows. It's going to be um, rows of chairs. It'd be kind of like a meeting room, multi-purpose room where then it overlooks the stadium. And this is where I can imagine in my head an official visit weekend in the summer where it's Friday afternoon, Friday evening. You've got all the recruits and their families there. Lance Leipold goes up to kind of kick off the weekend and say, hey, you know, this stadium here is new and look at all the commitment we have to football. And everything you're about to see this weekend is about commitment to football. And I just think it's really cool. And so a couple things to know. They're going to expand a lot of the coaching office space. I don't know the last time you walked in the coach's office, Kevin. I don't know if you <laughs> when the last time you would have done that, but um, I've been wa- been around it a, a while because of camp, and I get to work in uh, the media relations office. And you walk around, and the analyst's office is crammed. The video department is crammed. I mean, even some of the coach's office, right? Important people have small offices. And so what's going to happen now is they're going to expand the coaching offices. The coaching locker room is also going to be expanded. Someone mentioned that to me where it's small. And these are all things that can help keep coaches around. Sure. Right. Lance Apple talks a lot about coaching staff continuity. Well, there's now better spaces for the coaches to do their work, have better morale around the building. That's huge. Now there's also room for players, right? They had to take out the player lounge to make room for the extra locker room space in the locker and locker space in the locker room, I should say. So now they're going to put that somewhere else. And so I think there's just a lot of really cool stuff they're going to end up doing with Anderson family football complex. I think it's just going to elevate it to where Kansas has the locker room. They got the weight room now, and now it's going to make the rest of the facility feel like the new stuff that just came in this past week. Um, have you seen those renderings yet, Kevin on Twitter? I don't have them all here on the, on the YouTube. Yeah. But have you seen them? Yeah. And I, I thought the medical stuff was cool too. You know, the hydrotherapy stuff yeah. that you see, you know, a lot of these things and, you know, I'm, I'm not saying what they're doing now is outdated. I'm saying the fact that it's taken them this long to, to get to these points. Mm-hmm. There are things that we've seen, you know, at facilities like Alabama and Clemson yeah. and, you know, these really nice facilities for a while. And, and, and so it, again, it's not, it's not that what they're doing, what they're doing now is going to be state of the art. And, mm-hmm. and so it's, it's going to be top of the line, but I, I thought your, your stuff on the video crew and, and coaches offices and everything was interesting because I think that helps in recruiting too. And I know that sounds weird, but players are, are able to see when they go and meet with their position coach and, mm-hmm. and they talk to him when they come in and visit, like, oh man, like coach has, has a closet for an office. And, and I'm not necessarily saying that that's the case with everybody, but they also notice when they go somewhere like Alabama and you see support staffers that have more space and can spread out and they can say, Oh my gosh, everything here is first class. And and I think Kansas is taking a a major step in that direction. I I think the medical stuff sounded really great. The players lounge sounds amazing. The locker room looks amazing. I mean, you were actually in there. I mean, I, I, I've just seen through the eyes of your camera, but you know, to to lose the players' lounge stuff for that locker room stuff, and then get an even bigger players' lounge with more stuff on, on the end of it. I think they're getting, you know, if I remember right, they're yeah. getting brand new like video room and media room stuff. You know, you you just you look at all of the different pieces sort of coming together, and. Uh, I know that we're keeping this to the facilities, but so much of this is is recruiting based, right? So when we talked in our, I think it was our June recruiting primer, 
uh, or maybe it was right after that. It might have been in July. Mm -hmm. The amount of success that this staff is having with kids when they can get them onto campus. Mm -hmm. And then you add yeah. this to to what they're selling, where they're no longer just selling a vision or a piece of paper or or whatever else, where they can take a kid through the players' lounge. They can show them, hey, look at all the improvements to Memorial Stadium and things like that, and there's something tangible there. All of that adds up, I think, to to make for a, a, a pretty strong recruiting pitch for, for coaches who, quite frankly, were doing really well with official visit guys as it is. Yeah, exactly. And look, I think the way that Kansas has handled this too is a big statement to Lance Leipold and what he really prioritizes because what they could have done this reverse, right? They could have focused on the stadium first and given the player stuff later, but Lance Leipold said, well, if we're going to do commitment, we need to show commitment to the current players and show them how much we value them. And I think this type of statement, I think goes a long way in doing the locker room first and doing the weight room first, make sure these current players get a feel for what it's like to be a Kansas football player under this new athletic department. And then from there, they can build it out. And so I think they can go to recruits now and say, look, we prioritize the players first. We didn't prioritize the stadium or anything else. We prioritized you first because you are what make this program. And I think that speaks volumes to, I think, the people that are running this football program. And I think it also is going to help them a lot in recruiting because – it's relationship based, it's player development based, and that's exactly what the coaches have shown. And so I think all these things come together and there's going to be a really convincing recruiting pitch. And I was thinking about this too, Kevin, like the guys that just committed this summer didn't even see this stuff. Yeah, Like they didn't see the locker room. They didn't see the weight room. There was construction. It was a hard hat zone. Like guys weren't, you know, you're not walking in and getting a sneak peek at the locker room. Like the guys didn't see it. And so now you're looking next June, right? And there's going to be more construction going on. I'm interested to see what happens with the coaching offices next summer and how they're going to time this to work with year-round recruiting. But next summer, the guys that come in are going to be able to see the locker room. They'll be able to see the weight room. They'll be able to see the construction that's going around. And for them, too, the crazy part now, Kevin, we're in the class of 2025. Yep. These are guys that, as freshmen, are going to be able to have this new stadium. Well, I'll even, I'll even take it a step further. What about the guy, the 2025 guys that they've already had on campus? Because oh, oh, Andrew so Babalola, yeah. Bryce and Hayes, yeah. guys like that, all of a sudden you can show them, you know, hey, you were here last year. You remember what this looked like or what this didn't mm -hmm. look like. Now look at all of this and you're going to have, you know, sort of the sparkling new stadium facilities, things like this. You know, yeah. we keep our promises. You can see the construction here. And, and so uh, I think, you know, it, it probably does help them in that class of 2025. But I think some of the guys that it could really help them with are 2025 guys that they've already had out, that have already yeah, seen guys. what it is now. And then they get to look at what it is later, too. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, I'm fascinated to see whether that helps them because, Obviously, not everything is based on, on in-state recruiting, but at the same time, you know, 2025 is a really strong class in the state of Kansas, and mm -hmm. Kansas is in with a few of those guys at or near the top of that class. You know, is this the sort of thing that that will help them, you know, sort of make noise with those guys and, and maybe maybe help them turn where they say, okay, Kansas is making the investment, and they're not just telling me about it. I can see it because I was yeah. here before and I'm here now and, and seeing while this is going on. Yeah. Well, Lance Lapold said it's a game changing statement and that's exactly what this is for Kansas football. Um, Kevin, any other final thoughts on anything that, that transpired today? I think I'm out. I think I'm tapped out. I'm yeah. ready. Yeah. It's been a, no, I it's think, been I think we hit most of it. It's uh, it's exciting news. I, I'm interested to see, like you said, I mean, are the is it the second the season ends you know all of a sudden we're we're seeing cranes and wrecking balls and stuff out there or does it does it take a little while and then you know i i think we'll be interested in hearing the answers you know a, get a little bit more detail on the 2024 capacity things like that but but generally speaking it was a lot of information you know, getting to see it with the renderings and everything where it's not just somebody telling you about it, but you can see what it would look like. Uh, I think all of that, it was, uh, 
it, it was a pretty cool day. It was a it was a cool day. Cool to see a lot of people around too. Um, Kevin, we made it under forty five minutes. I think like that's it. We we deserve like pats on the back here because usually yeah. We I was are, gonna say we better cut ourselves game. off here so that we don't go over. So yeah, exactly. Well, hey, look, I mean, we're gonna have another podcast here coming your way. Um, and what today's Tuesday? They wrap up fall camp, I believe, on Saturday. First day of school is next Monday. So I think we're gonna aim for a podcast this upcoming weekend to talk specifically fall camp. We'll give some standouts, preseason predictions, all that good stuff. Kevin, thank you as always for joining. And hey, thanks everyone for listening again to the fog.net podcast. If you like what you heard, please leave a rating and review on iTunes. Those go a long way in helping with the algorithms and, and all that stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you like the video and you are subscribed to the channel. As you've seen a lot of fall camp interviews, another podcast coming soon. Lots of video content coming your way on the YouTube channel. But Kevin, thank you as always for joining and thank you, the listener, for always listening to the Fog.net podcast. We will talk to you again 